Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Welcome everyone to CBD Talk Podcast. Tonight is episode 64 and we have with us um, an amazing uh, creator of uh, one of my favorite products, uh, which we'll get to later. Uh, but this is Matt Buglioni from Due Santi. And Hello so- there. Thanks Hello. for having me. So great to have you. So um, let's jump right in because I know we have a lot to talk about tonight. Um, how about you tell us how you got into working with CPD, how you joined the industry? Jeez, well, it seems like it's been over a decade now, but it's really only been, what, four or five years, I think almost five years now, um, when right around the time hemp became legal in Colorado, um, I was pretty focused on getting involved in the marijuana industry. Um, so I had some very small scale um, hemp, uh, well, botanical processing equipment that I also could be used to process hemp oil. Um, and I quickly realized getting involved in the marijuana industry involved a lot of red tape and just uh, difficulty. And there's so many barriers to get involved. And so I, um, I decided the hemp industry was a little bit more flexible and it was more of a, I could see it becoming more of a commodity and um, it was just more of an agricultural product that had, what I, in my opinion, and I still believe today it just has way, way more potential. Um, so I'm glad I did make that choice to go more into the hemp industry. And really, I, you know, I started off bootstrapping it. I had um, one little machine that um, processed hemp. Um, for one of the first hemp farms in Colorado, um, honestly, I just cold called the farm and said, "Hey, can I set up shop on your on your farm?" And they said yes. So uh, we ended up processing all that material on that farm, and um, it was tough, <laughs> a lot of a lot of issues, but we made it through. And um, since then, we've expanded, and um, I have many, many dozens, if not hundreds, of uh, clients and I've moved and grown facilities four times now. Um, uh, you know, honest to God, we started in something that resembled more of a shack than anything, <laughs> but uh, we've, it's been it's been crazy a crazy ride so far, and we we've grown rapidly. So I, I can't complain. The, all the pain and headache was worth it. Now, is your extraction company also called Dewey Santi? So no, my. Uh, Dewey Santi is just a retail, mm-hmm. and um, and we, we supply our Dewey Santi through Phytopure, that's spelled P-H-Y-T-O, Phytopure Labs, and that's a, just a, a processing-specific company, which we supply ourselves, uh, Dewey Santi, and then many other retail brands buy our extracts. Nice. Very yeah. nice. So it started with Phytopure, and then, uh, you know, we kind of, uh, dabble in other parts of the industry, see what works. We've we've done some farming on our own. Um, uh, we've since outsourced a lot of the farming side of things because, as many people know, farming is not easy, especially if you're not coming from a farming background. Um, but so we kind of outsourced a lot of that, and you know, this this um, spring we are actually going to get back into some of the farming side of things. Uh, uh, because, you know, I partnered with some people that are uh, pretty well versed in the whole farming side. So, uh, you know, it's be interesting to see. Maybe, you know, I'd be happy to go into details about the whole farming side. Yeah, because- definitely. So that's, that's something we want to talk about is um, the pros and cons of different farming methods. So you, you've done enough of it to kind of have a feel for what works and what doesn't and why. So how about you Um, touch on that a little? Well, let's see where to start. Um, You know, early on, right when hemp became legal, um, that the the seed stock of high quality genetics just didn't exist. Or if it did, it was so minimal that it it would be extremely difficult to um, grow 
a substantial crop, like anything over five acres. Um, now we're looking at hundreds of acres of growing. Um, so, you know, it really started with cloning um, from a very stable and tested mother uh, mother plant that had, you know, tested to be high in CBD and also below the 0.3% THC when it's in full flower. Um, we, you know, so our first farm was small and I think we did, you know, what was it? We produced 10,000 clones and grew it on, you know, six or seven acres. Um, but cloning has its, uh, there's a, there's a limit to how much you can actually grow doing cloning because it's just so labor intensive and, and a clone is basically like a baby. It's, it's like taking over or watching 10, 20, 50,000 babies all at once. So <laughs> it's not, it, it was, it was a headache. Um, even the, even by hiring in some experts, it's just so costly to maintain those clones with proper nutrients, lights. You have to gradually, um, introduce them to more intense light so they start under uh, t5 style light very low intensity I, I believe they're fluorescent i'm not sure but uh, you take clippings off these tested mother plants and then they slowly the clipping will produce roots and then you gradually under proper humidity and temperature and um, light you have to gradually introduce it to more intense light so we go from there to more of a uh, your typical grow light, like a 600 or 1000 watt light. Um, kind of then from there, we go in, out into the greenhouse and uh, under a shade cloth, which is just, it filters the sunlight even more. And then from there, after the, the plants are a little bit more um, substantial, you can go out and do a field and plant them um, either by hand or behind a tractor they have these planting machines that are planting attachments which will plop them in the ground it's pretty neat to see it all done mm -hmm. and it's uh, still a, a very doable thing I, I think the um, tobacco industry may still do something similar to that uh -huh. um, but uh, what we found is it's just to do anything at scale and given the amount of uh, biomass that we go through on a, a monthly basis it's just it's not going to work for our operation so what we've since done is um, bred some real premium premium genetics and we've developed a nice uh, seed stock base that we can now grow from seed beautiful um, yeah and <laughs> there's still issues because <laughs> So well, seeds, yeah, it's you know, there's, a certain percentage of, there's a certain percentage of those seeds which will be male plants. We don't want male plants in our crop because they will pollinate and then turn all the female plants into seed. So the next step would be to feminize all those seeds. And that's a tricky process in itself. I think we've figured it out pretty well to get us through the next season. Um, but with that said, we can... Um, now plant seeds directly into the ground with a, behind a tractor, just lay seed, or we can um, uh, propagate those seeds in our facility. Uh, you know, many tens or if not hundreds of thousands of seeds at any given time um, inside, so they, they basically grow small juvenile plants, which can then be either uh, planted, you know, in the ground or it, they're, they're basically a seed crop is a little bit more so um, it grows more vigorously it has a strong tap root and uh and you don't have to baby little, it as much pardon you don't have to baby it as much you don't have to baby it as much it's just you th it kind of one of those things you throw in the ground and has a much better chance of survival because mm. it's a very a more a tougher plant um, to begin with and and also you can you know, we're looking into some overhead pivot types of uh, watering instead of drip tape. Uh, we had a, quite the time uh, battling the gophers out in the field trying to chew our drip tape. <laughs> <laughs> especially out in, in Colorado, it's pretty dry, especially eastern Colorado. There's um, 
not a whole lot of water. So those, you know, <clears throat> dogs, or whatever you want to call it, they really had a fun time chewing through all the drip tape. And you'd have to figure out why, you know, two rows of plants are dying because some, somewhere underground there's leak. Um, so it's been interesting. And that's just a few issues that we've come across. There's bugs, there's um, pests, and there's also the, a big problem of hemp farms being too close together and they can kind of cross-pollinate each other. Oh, um, you know, I didn't think about that. Now, yeah, I, had, so, I had heard that um, with growing hemp that uh, compared to other um, plants that or crops that may, that people may choose to grow, uh, that the, the bug problem isn't as substantial as it is with other uh, agriculture. Um, maybe to certain bugs, but then, you know, like caterpillars love to eat the hemp. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. There's a lot that goes around <laughs> Oh my God! But, but I just, really, when you try it for yourself, you'll you realize like, whoa, this is crazy. But, I just got the visual <laughs> of that caterpillar from Alice in Wonderland yeah. smoking on his hookah. <laughs> that maybe that's where it came from. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, so I think some of these farms are diversifying in terms of geog or geography or location. I know some big companies in Colorado that are kind of scattered all over the state now to a to avoid, I think primarily hail. Mm -hmm. um, drought is another one. And some places in uh, southern Colorado, you know, they didn't have the water supply, and um, bugs are an issue. And so, I guess the more you spread your farms out, the more the less chance of them all getting hit at once. That's but, really smart. Yeah, yeah, diversifying like that. Yeah, so we, so from our company standpoint, we've we're really looking into um, some seed propagation, um, overhead pivot, just less labor, um, and there's pros and cons to the, the pivot as well. Um, but we kind of we're going to do a little bit of each um, method this year and just see what what worked best. Um, well, let's move on to the next step. Sure. And uh, and farming help, which would be harvesting and extraction. Let's go to extraction. You obviously are very well versed in <laughs> extraction. So can you talk about the different methods and just some things, uh, you know, I'm guessing a lot of our listeners have no clue uh, about an extraction process. they just clueless. So how about you? Um, Share some insight on that a little. Uh, let's see where to start with that. Um, I think there's three or four main methods of extraction at the moment. There's a few others, that, but I don't, I don't think they're at scale. Um, you know, they, I think uh, food grade ethanol is probably one of the most common extraction methods right now because it's. Um, somewhat cost effective ethanol still if you're getting the high end ethanol it's pretty expensive and there's an excise tax involved which is very substantial um ethanol it's a relatively clean solvent um, it can be purged from the um, oil that you're extracting relatively easy um, at, at a lower temperature so you preserve a lot of the other beneficial compounds in the oil, like um, various other cannabinoids and um, terpenes. Um, ethanol is more, I think, uh, for bulk production. You can really extract a lot of hemp or biomass in a day. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, um, you know, there is a flam flammable substance, so you need to be in a and do this in a properly uh, zoned and, and licensed facility, uh, which is proven to be pretty difficult to find that kind of facility in, uh, especially Colorado. Um, but you know, if you can if you can do that, it's, it makes a very good oil. Um, it's easy to um, extract 
and it's pretty straightforward. I think the biggest bottleneck with ethanol extraction is that you have to figure out how to reclaim that alcohol. In other words, how do you separate it from the uh, hemp extract that you're trying to isolate? And mm -hmm. uh, you need some pretty, it requires some pretty expensive um, solvent recovery systems to, to do that um, at, at volume. I mean, these things are very expensive. They get, you know, you can get over a million dollars for just one little piece of equipment wow. uh, with the, the scale that we're trying to go here. Um, and, but I think overall, it's very, it makes a very good, very good extract and it's relatively easy to work with. Some people are still doing a hydrocarbon extraction and those machines are starting to get a little bit larger, a little bit, um, more automated um, and safer, you know, hydrocarbons are also, uh, they can be flammable if you do it in an unapproved area and with a machine that's not certified. Um, but, you know, I think it's both methods are still generally safe. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's been some stigma, stigmas out there with, with, um, some hydrocarbon equipment. It's people are yeah, you know, using them in their house, which is a pretty dumb idea, in my opinion. But um, you know, there's. I think hydrocarbon actually makes a very a good um, uh, first extraction. It's a, it makes a very good crude oil. It's a stronger solvent. It washes. It pulls a lot more out of the plant. Um, mm -hmm. so you get ten, you tend to get a little bit higher. Um, potency oil right from the get-go. Uh, I mean, you'll see a little bit higher levels in CBD and CBG, CBN, and various other compounds uh, where you, as you couldn't get that all out with other methods of extraction. Um, we do see some other people using supercritical CO2, which is another great method. I think maybe limited on scalability with, with that method because they're very expensive machines and they kind of have a capacity limit. Um, but, you know, it's a very non-toxic extraction method um, and it just depends on which part you're going. I think overall, if you're refining that oil and purging it of all the solvents and, um, you know, you're purifying it downstream, I don't, I don't see... Uh, I don't really see a drawback to any one of them uh, mm -hmm. in terms of what's better in the final product. But, uh, you know, I've also, we've also heard um, people trying to extract with water, um, which is interesting. I don't know too much about it, but um, it seems to be a pretty uh, good way to go through a lot of material quickly and not be. Um, not have to combat the local um, municipalities in terms of zoning and what you can and cannot do because it's just water. Mm -hmm. That's um, interesting. <laughs> that yeah, yeah, I mean, there's more details than that. That's pretty, just yeah. a pretty simple way of saying it, but uh, there's there's several other methods as well. Um, and I, I think for what for hemp processing, we have to think a little bit larger. Uh, in terms of capacity, whereas some of the boutique marijuana guys, um, they can do more high-end, small-scale stuff, which is uh, pretty cool in its own right. But yeah, I like I like the fact that you know uh, we compared it before to craft beer. How yeah. you can have a Budweiser or, or you know whatever, and then you can have one of these local artisan type beers yeah you know i, I think there's always going to be a be room for the small guys in this industry because there's going to be that artisan mm -hmm. small brewery that people still want to go to you know Coors light's great but uh that's it's just a different a different arena there um i think uh yeah it, it, i think there's room for everybody in this industry um I, you know, we'll see what this farm bill does, but I, 
I think it's going to be overall great for the industry. I mean, I have some concerns like big industry getting involved and just running over the small guys a little bit, but mm -hmm. I hope that doesn't happen. I, it's, it seems to be an overall, um, uh, who you know industry. Um, I think people on all ends of the this hemp industry like prefer to work together and work with people that have come from nothing and made it happen. Mm -hmm. I, I see a lot of camaraderie in that regard. Um, yeah. And I, it's, it's pretty cool to see that. Even yeah. though, you know, even if they were approached by a large company, I think still you, they, some of these retail brands would rather work with some, you know, local, local businesses. Uh, yeah, I think they'd be taking a big chance if they worked with one with some big entity that. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> they don't. They don't have the. I don't think these big entities will have the ability to uh, fine tune. I guess you could say the, the the oil. You know, like depending on the application. So it's a vapor pen company. You know, they want to make sure it's the proper viscosity, mm -hmm. uh, potency, and. and <clears throat> In color, you know, it's a it's a visual thing. Um, they want to make sure that the oil doesn't crystallize yeah, in, in the material. Whereas, like a, a a pet food company might not care how the oil looks because it's getting mixed into pet treats or something. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think being you know being boutique, we have the ability to kind of stop what we're doing and change things and, and adapt and. Well, so, also, you know that certain certain formulations just really don't scale up well. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's, for for certain products, it's just not going to be um, that they want to keep the, the efficacy. It just might not, you know, it might not be something that a, um, a large scale company will be even able to yeah. produce. So. You know, then to supply these, you know, if a huge processor came to town, to supply that processor with enough material to get them going, it would require so much material that um, you go too big on the farming. And we, we've noticed, because I, I, we get samples dropped off to us all the time, mm -hmm. um, you know, farmers trying to have us buy their material. Uh, you notice when the farms get a little bit too big, they kind of you kind of lose control of quality just a hair. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to manage all that, and so we, we prefer to work with just kind of medium-sized farms. And um, yeah, it's, it seems to be pretty good so far. Colorado did have some a little bit of issue this this year with people trying to to um, uh, they, they were trying to start farming with seed and there was a lot of instability with the quality of seed this year mm -hmm. so we saw a lot of material that uh, the plants kind of hermaphrodite and they or they turned to males or they or <laughs> it, was, it was just crazy so you saw a lot of seed in the crop this year and mm. the result potency of the flower went down just a hair uh, still a lot of good stuff out there mm -hmm. uh, um, there's some farms on either coast to east and west coast now that are doing some interesting things um some farms on the east coast though they had some issues with rain during harvest so there were some mildew issues um but uh and there's so much to learn and i think people are learning rapidly that's yeah. for sure well uh, let's talk to you let's talk since you talked about since you mentioned mildew let's talk about testing and the importance of testing Okay. So that people know what they're getting, and I, I think that some people, and just going to bring up. Um, so, for example, we have people listening from from all over the place. Um, but let's see, in the month of November, we had oh, most of our listeners from the states, but we also had um, listeners from the UK and Canada. Uh, our biggest group was from Salt Lake City, Utah, and I don't know if they know a whole lot about it there yet. <laughs> and then Chicago, yeah. and then LA. So we've got people kind of spread out. Um, yeah. I think I, I think that there are a lot of people who who just think 
hemp is hemp, whatever, you know, and, and that there's no difference between one bottle and another bottle or one crop from another crop. Um, and that's, I think, where testing is really uh, a, a great help. And so, yeah, to, to let people know what they're actually getting. So and it's such a, it's such a pain. Um, maybe this farm bill, if it passes, it'll help um, streamline the testing process a little bit because it seems to be all over the board. Mm. Um, I mean, you could take three samples of a product to one lab and then you get three different results. Mm. Um, if, you know, we so we do our own testing in house. Um, the best we can that's not our specialty but we really we get a general idea and then we'll we will send that sample out to multiple third party um mm -hmm. testing centers and we <coughs> sort of average all of them best we can and we you know understand there could be about a four percent variance in either direction mm -hmm. with this stuff. we hope that technology gets a little bit better soon um it really help out um but you know it all starts with the flower we you, you sort of you get flower tested and it's still, even with a potency test we still like to extract that oil test the oil and then test the final products that it's going into uh, just because you know, one one batch of hemp could be testing 14 percent but the overall lot of, uh, the overall lot of the hemp is eight percent um there's a lot of variables with that and it's, mm -hmm. it has caused some big problems in the industry um, so even within a crop and within a product it can it oh yeah I mean, but, I mean people like to test the the best looking bud or flower out mm -hmm. of a pack right uh -huh. <laughs> They'll represent ten thousand. That'll represent ten thousand pounds. Well, that's not really the case. Um, usually, it's lower than that. It depends if it's the product's been milled or mm -hmm. how it's been homogenized. Um, it's yeah. It's we've rarely seen stuff that actually tests on a large lot in several thousand pounds over twelve percent. Uh, and Twelve percent is a very hard number to beat, and we've we've seen some people out there with eighteen percent material um, on smaller batches. Um, and are there is there a difference between it being grown inside or outside? Uh, well, I think generally hemp is grown outside just because it's uh, it's not worth enough per pound to really mm -hmm. put all that energy into growing it inside. Um, it's you know it's. Um, it's more of a agricultural mm -hmm. crop it's meant to be grown outside in bulk. Um, but like I say, you don't want to go too big out of it straight out of the gate because then the quality suffers dramatically. And then even how you how you harvest the material, um, it's uh, you know obviously done by hand and hung like tobacco upside down mm -hmm. in a proper drying facility really is the best bet. We we've. Seen, I've seen some farms where they didn't have proper drying um, and the, you know, these trichomes that hold the oil, they dry out. And when the wind comes blowing, it's all your trichomes. Oh and no. You can, you can lose half the, the value of your overall farm by just those trichomes blowing away in the wind. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's also comes to, when it comes to harvest times, some people are going more towards um using combines, which it makes it a heck of a lot easier to bag and harvest and uh, be done with the farm. But it also, I've seen a bit of a decrease in overall potency on stuff that's been combined. Mm -hmm. um, it gets so milled down and blown away in the wind that it goes so down to air. Still, still overall pretty good stuff. But yeah, because yeah. then at that point, I think you have to, to do the, the valuation you know, like, you know, before and after or this mm -hmm. and that, like, well, is it worth the man hours? Is it worth the, yeah. you know, how much money are we actually losing? Yeah. And when you go larger scale, you don't really have an option. I think it's <clears throat> part of the business plan there. Yeah. Yeah. But, that's interesting. But that's okay. It just depends on what the direction you're going. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I said before, I think there's room for everybody. You just kind of have to pick a little bit of a niche in the market and stick to it. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've, from my own experience earlier on, I, I got stretched in so many different directions because there's you know so much opportunity everywhere. You know, you could sell clones, you could you could sell soil to the farmers, nutrients, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> seeds. Farm. I mean, you, it goes on and on and on. You, you if you're uh, entrepreneurial like myself, you seek all these, you see all these opportunities. You go, oh my God, I got to do this and that. And then, and I quickly realized I wasted a whole summer and I might as well just stick to what I'm good at. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is. I, I can definitely see how that could happen very easily. <laughs> There's just yeah. so much opportunity. And mm -hmm. when you love a plant, it, you just, you know, you want oh, it's to do as much as you can. It's, it's great. Um, uh, not to get too far off on a tangent, but we are doing some really cool, um, growing some really neat genetics this year, which mm -hmm. are not only rich in CBD, but rich in CBN and CBG. Good. Yeah. And that really adds to the, the overall quote unquote entourage effect. Mm -hmm. um, we're a big believer in that. Yeah. Uh, as uh, we've sampled a lot of different products and I think it's just far more um, effective from a medicinal standpoint mm -hmm. uh, it had, even to have a tiny bit of THC in there and uh, you know obviously CBD but those other compounds as well that just um, add to the overall effect and you know, I, th I think what we envision as a company is to eventually have unique unique farms that are you know, growing these CBN genetics or CB, CBG genetics and Good. kind of create a standard for each one of them and then kind of formulate and mix and match those those compounds and really hopefully when uh, if this becomes federally legal we can create uh, test this stuff uh, uh, you know well yeah do the studies to find out you know what what receptors are acting with which cannabinoids and and how it can how you can best use that cannabinoid to benefit your health that's exactly and, and you know, from there we can get the proper entities involved that are you know they fully understand how to test this yeah. or not you know we really like to partner up with a university or mm -hmm. any sort of sort of research institute that can help us develop this even further. Yeah, that's a wonderful, wonderful opportunities. It's an amazing industry. Oh, the people we've helped, like uh, a lot of children that suffer from epilepsy, we've seen great results. Um, yeah, it's, it's just incredible. I mean, this, this, is no, this is, isn't a joke. It's really, uh, it's not some placebo effect. We really believe in it. It works. And we hope to study it even more. Yeah, it is. And that, I think, is why um, so many people stay in the industry, because they can see, I mean, literally on a child's face. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they can see the impact of, of what they're doing. And it's kind of hard to walk away from that. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. It's fun to see a lot of the... A lot of the people that have maybe converted <laughs> over to believing in this, like even my parents, and some of the some older generations, they mm -hmm. were so anti marijuana, pot, and, and hemp. We got thrown into the mix. Yeah, um, and it's it's just nice to see. I mean, even my grandmother uh, has purchased CBD and used it and. Uh, it seems to be helping with her vertigo. Nice. Which is kind of nice to see. And, and treat some minor depression. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's, yeah, we're all about it. Yeah, now we just need the education to reach the doctors so that they can, re you know, take a look at the endocannabinoid system and, and uh, you know, so that they can they can understand how to help their patients. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, 
And a lot of doctors out there know what the endocannabinoid system is. And hate to break it to you, but it's a real thing. It's been proven. <laughs> this is not. <laughs> this isn't something that's just like made up. No, it's <laughs> your body has an endocannabinoid system. My dog and my cat. You know, they they have endocannabinoid systems as well. You know, I've been doing this for over five years. I still can barely pronounce endocannabinoid or cannabinoid. <laughs> so what is yeah. it? Well, is and that's, it, that's the thing. It's like, or, <laughs> it's exactly. Or... But it's, you know, it's it's the whole potato-potato thing. It's like, I, you know, some people say cannabinoid, some people say cannabinoid. It's, like, it's the same thing. So I, I know at some point you're going to be like, oh, you say it this way. Oh, and I'm like, yeah, that's what I am. So, <laughs> it's, I don't know, it's kind of like a soda or a pop, you know. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So how about we talk about, oh, this is the mini bottle, this is, this is the basil, this is Dewey Sante's olive oil sure. with 25 milligrams of CBD per tablespoon, but I, I literally, this is like aromatherapy for me, the, the, <laughs> oh my gosh, the basil just, oh, jeez Louise. Uh, so we have six different flavors. Um, we have uh, basil, jalapeno, plain, Italian herbs, lemon, garlic. Um, you know, so there's something for everyone. Um, so several bottle sizes. And we did just release a tincture as well. It's kind of just an added kick to someone that might want a little bit more CBD. Oh, tell me about the tincture. I didn't know about that. Yeah, it's a 2,000 milligram tincture. And... Um, is that it's one? Is that um? Is that thirty oh, mil or sixty one ounce? Okay. Yeah, so uh, thirty mil, mm -hmm. uh, one ounce tincture, and two thousand milligrams. So it's pretty concentrated. Um, using some of our full spectrum extract, and it's the same ingredients as the olive oil. It's just uh, plain olive oil, mm -hmm. and with our, you know, our in-house produced CBD extract and um, yeah you can just add it to whatever you're cooking with add it to the olive oil and just gives a little bit more of a what I think of as a relaxation effect but mm -hmm. the fact that everybody different um, and it, yeah so you can take it orally as well by itself now we we were on Facebook live for a, a few minutes before the podcast started to just kind of let people know what the podcast was about tonight um, so we talked a little bit out there on there that's not it's gonna show up on on the, the podcast episode, but tell let's let's mention again where you get your olive oil. Um I won't get a, get exact Well no 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 no, 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 no. Yeah. Get, <laughs> We don't want we don't want intruders into our uh -uh. secret. <laughs> But uh, it's just in Southern California. There's just a few small orchards and by a family-run um, company, and they do all the the press, cold um, pressing of the olive oil there in house. And um, we buy it in bulk, in you know, 50-gallon drums. Wow. Um, and they it will they do all the flavor infusing there. Um, and what else do you need to know? It's, oh, it's, so then, so then, when you get the when you get it at your location, that's when you add the. the yes, yeah, so we we take that into our facility where we do the, the hemp extraction itself, and we mm -hmm. take that to a kind of a food grade bottling area of the facility, and um, it's all done by hand at this point. Maybe down the road, we'll invest in some bottling equipment because it's kind of getting to that point where it's pretty <laughs> tedious. It's just like, oh my God, how many things do I have to do right now? Um, I just <laughs> love that your olive oil comes from, a, you know, the family-owned farm in California. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's very simple and straightforward. It's like a cold uh, pressed extraction method, um, almost like a rosin press, uh, hmm. like you do with mar marijuana. But, um, it's just a, you know, it's stored in stainless steel tanks there, and um, 
bottled soon after and then they ship it all over the country but uh, i think we're the only people that are mixing it with cbd extract to make a cbd infused olive oil um and then uh yeah we do we do the mixing in house we have the proper homogenizing Mm -hmm. machines and so what is your favorite thing to do with your oil with your with your olive oil because what um, when i when i tried it it was with the you know, just the, the pieces of bread you just dip it in there oh my gosh it's just the flavor is ridiculous yeah. well thank you um well I'm, I'm always on the go so i tend to eat leftovers and <laughs> I have a lot of Tupperware that we, so I'll throw in the, the dinner from before in the Tupperware. I'll usually just drizzle with some Italian herb flavored olive oil on, um, on top, mm-hmm. or I'll put it in a little, in a little um, side dish and use it as dipping sauce. Um, but it's the lemon flavor is great on salads, and um, you can even cook with it. Under you can't fry this stuff, you know. There's some yet to be studies done that will determine at what point this CBD degrades on a, a skillet. I'm not mm-hmm. entirely sure. And we, you know, we've, we haven't. Um, because with extractions, you know, it gets to a certain temperature it, and it starts. Well, so it, 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 certain cannabinoids can convert. So mm-hmm. CBN, um, which is, can be a byproduct from THC. Um, it can uh, it converts C- THC can convert to CBN with heat. So, you know, from using this oil on a skillet, I haven't necess- I can't say I've seen uh, any degradation. Um, mm-hmm. Now that's I'm not entirely sure because we haven't been legally been able to study this properly. But yeah, uh, I think. You know, and I think it's still uh, still very beneficial. And in the worst case scenario, these cannabinoids are just going to convert to another form. Uh, like THC oxidizes to CBN. So, um, yeah. It, but using it in a salad dressing or oh yeah, camping, absolutely. And oh my gosh. It's so all our all our oils fully. It's a, it's a distillate, so we can. You know, basically process our crude oil to a distillate form and refine that through several steps. Um, but it's what we use is a full spectrum um, distillate, and it's as rich as it can get at the moment in various other cannabinoids. Um, and you know, it's has CBN, CBG, and CBD, um, mm. um, so it's all converted from its um, from CBDA, and mm-hmm. you know, we're 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 excited to bring unleash some new genetics this year, which will give us some more potent CBG oil. Um, and then CBN, as many people know, is can be used as a sleep aid, mm-hmm. uh, and that stuff will knock you out. It's like taking uh, <laughs> like taking Nyquil. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I had I had read somewhere today that um, they compared it five milligrams of CBN to ten milligrams of some. I oh gosh, I can't remember. It was a it was a pharmaceutical, and the efficacy was right on the same. Uh, <laughs> so it was that was very. I found that very interesting. I I have no problem falling asleep. I have a problem. <laughs> my cat's waking me up at 3 a.m. because they're hungry. That's <laughs> that's my. I have, a, I have a nine-month-old border collie. He he likes to jump around and wake me up. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> <laughs> but hey, that's, that's just part of pet parenthood. So so yeah, um worth it. Yeah, but I I I do have to say that God, your products, man. Oh, they taste so good. Well, you know, we really wanted to just create a product that was, um, uh, I guess, what the, what's the word? Just uh, more well known. Um, mm-hmm. it, people generally are not afraid of using olive oil, uh, mm-hmm. and 
infused with a mild dose of CBD um, is, I think it's a good way to introduce some people that are unfamiliar with the industry uh, mm -hmm. CBD and you can kind of start there and uh, work your way into other products um, yeah some that might have a greater potency yeah I could I could definitely like like we said one tablespoon has about 25 milligrams of CBD and I could easily be putting a tablespoon of this you know drizzle it over piece of pizza or whatever yeah yeah exactly and you, you can use half a tablespoon and, and you got you know half a dosing so yeah uh, that, I, it, just the potency is I, I it's unbelievable you know <laughs> that one tablespoon has that much and it tastes that good it just I usually well, we, do not freak out this much about a product, but oh my God, I really like them. Thank you. Guys, you. seriously, you've got to, what's your website? I need to put it in the in the show notes. Let me type it out. Uh, so our, our website's duesanti.com, D-U-E-S-A-N-T-I.com. Okay, I'll make sure I get that in the in there so people can, can click on it. And we, we did our best to... Uh, choose a uh, olive oil that's kind of it masks the bitterness of cbd because mm -hmm. cbd by itself it doesn't taste that great it's been <laughs> really nasty um maybe we once had a this hemp guru guy come out to our our farm and he he started chewing on the hemp flower right yeah. off the plant and go, what are you doing he goes oh i'm, I'm going to tell you the potency of your flower by how bitter it is, <laughs> and and as a matter of fact, he was he was about one percent off, but real real almost spot on. Uh, wow, yeah, it was pretty neat. But it doesn't taste very good. <laughs> uh, no, it, it really doesn't. That's why it surprises me that. But the, I mean, I, a lot of people, a lot of products, it's it's in a capsule, so you don't have to taste it. It's you know, it, or it's in mm -hmm. a tincture that. That you just stick under your tongue, grit and bear it until it, you know, or 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 you take a dropper full and swallow it as quickly as humanly possible, and then shove a handful of Doritos in your mouth to get rid yeah. of the taste. Not that I have ever done that, but <laughs> yeah, more like a ice cream sandwich or something like that. <laughs> That's what I want. Yeah, well, to me, Doritos masks any taste, but. <laughs> But all right, so um, do you have any other products that you might be thinking about coming up for next year? Um, you know, we're really trying to focus on mm -hmm. offering some premium premium genetics. Well, mm -hmm. we're not offering, but we're for our own our own sake. Mm -hmm. um, so that's will, your focus for 2019 is get dialing in those genetics. It, it all starts with the hemp, right? If, mm -hmm. if you have very high quality hemp and, and it's abundant in other compounds that we're trying to extract, well, we can, you know, who knows, maybe we'll have a, a CBN line of Dewey Santi, um, you know, or a CBG rich oil. Um, so we look forward to that. And that that's just, I think, the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to come. Um, as you know, there's, yeah, I think, over 85 other active cannabinoids in hemp. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll be interesting to see uh, how we can try to express those those compounds. And, uh, it, take, it takes a few seasons to do that. Yeah, and it's also exciting to find out more about what those compounds can do. I mean, yeah, it, it's... I think the opportunity is endless. So I think you're going to start seeing not just from Dewey Santi, but some from some other uh, main brands out there, retail brands. That you're going to start seeing some uh, other cannabinoids thrown in the mix there mm -hmm. and advertised it as so. Yeah, I, it's exciting to know that that it's possible to get them to express more uh, because for years and years and years, so many have been bred out. Mm -hmm. They just kept breeding up the THC. And so having a more balanced plant, it's just 
it, it, to me it's it's very exciting kind of going back to the heirloom kind of <laughs> yeah, heirloom I, I hope we get a little bit more flexibility on the thc level it'd be really nice to see it get bumped up to maybe 0.5 percent mm -hmm. <laughs> 0.3 because it really um forces farmers to either harvest early or just not grow the plant to its full potential because it, it, that 0.3 percent creeps up very quickly mm -hmm. during the last few weeks of flower um, yeah. and that could draw some some issues instead of growing instead of your 50 acres being hemp it's all of a sudden marijuana and you're trying to figure out what to do yeah because you're not licensed to grow marijuana yeah that's that wouldn't be fun so. yeah not at all <laughs> All right. Well, any uh, any parting tips or uh, information you want to pass on to our listeners tonight? I think I think the listeners should give hemp-based products a, a try. You know, we've been talking about just CBD primarily, but in oil production. But it's not just oil that it, hemp can uh, produce. It's really the uh, construction purposes it's hemp seed oil which is it's a, an own slew of uh, benefits you know like omega-3 fatty acids and etc um, but i think uh, the construction industry could benefit and hemp crete hemp fiber mm. there's so much more to hemp than just what we talked about that's why we i think we could sit here and talk for the next two days but um, uh, maybe someday you have to get me back on here. And we can oh, talk for about. sure, for sure. <laughs> you know, one of the things I, I do really want to hear more about, and I haven't done it yet, is um, the petroleum potential. Oh, yeah. That, for me, is so interesting. So one of these days I'll have one of those, but no, we'll, we'll get you back on for sure. I just, uh, I, I'm just glad to finally get you on because, I met you back in September, so it's taken a bit to... Did we meet at the uh, trade show? In, mm -hmm. in Anaheim? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. And so it was... I, I'm glad to finally get you on. You're a tough man to, to track down sometimes. But. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have a lot going on. It's starting yeah. to a little bit in a, in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one, one more farming question. Sure. So how many crops can you get in, or cycles, or I'm not a farmer, uh, in in a year, in a calendar year? Oh, boy. Well, that depends on what latitude you're growing the, the plant. You know, there's... Uh, How about the eastern, eastern plains of Colorado? Um, I guess you technically could get into mm -hmm. plantings in a season. I... I don't see why people would do that because you could just plant it all at once. And I think the, the key is to get this, get the plant as large as it can be in its vegetative state. In other words, it's leafy state because in uh, Eastern Colorado or Colorado in general, the, the uh, hemp plant tends to convert to its flowering cycle uh, kind of like second week first, second week of August, mm -hmm. um, uh, depending on a lot of environmental factors. But, um, you know, then it basically you go from August to mid-October. And again, it depends on the weather and how, what kind of genetics you're growing. But you, you, know, you want to maximize both cycles there, flower and vegetative stage, just get mm -hmm. the, as much yield as possible. Um, yeah. I was just curious if the, because, you know, you hear about uh, crop rotation and things like that. Like yeah. if someone had like an early winter kind of crop, if it was something that, that, that they could have. Yeah, well, you, you could, I wouldn't grow it for, you know, oil. if you're using it as like a rotational crop, I would, I would do more of a low grade um, seed crop. Uh -huh. It requires very little maintenance and it's cheap to produce because it, you still get those uh, remediating um, benefits of, mm -hmm. of crop. You know, it, hemp pulls out a lot of um, junk out of the soil. So whether that's heavy metals or pesticides, it's going to 
it does clean the soil, which is a nice factor for. But then you got to be careful that it's not getting into your end product. That's, yeah, but it's, we but didn't talk about that. That's a whole other thing. So yeah. we're, we're very, very picky with who we source flour from because mm -hmm. we want to sure there's no, they didn't use pesticides. We want to make sure they're following orga organic practices. Mm -hmm. Um, or that the crop before them, the the soil, didn't have mm -hmm. terrible things in. Now, I mean, so I could see maybe um, using that for fiber or hempcrete or something like that. Yeah, you know. yeah, exactly. Um, I think those that approach is a little more. Uh, uh, I guess it's less expensive to possibly grow. Mm -hmm versus the oil you know we're trying to create a big ripe juicy fruit and uh, yeah. it it comes with a cost mm -hmm. and uh, again that's that's the difference between Coors Light and and yeah left hand brewing company there you go <laughs> left hand <laughs> 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 uh, yeah all right well thank you Matt we appreciate it well, um, maybe we'll, next time, maybe we will talk about um, what happens or, or uh, when. Oh, I mean, we could, we could go ahead and talk about the um, benefits of the, how hemp is, we've seen it benefiting um, cattle and ranch, ranches mm -hmm. and how the, these, Production animals. Well, like cattle are maintaining weight throughout the winter months longer, and that's all about. And I don't know a whole lot, heck of a lot about that, but mm -hmm. seeing some studies where it's helping the cattle maintain weight, which I think that's how these ranchers get paid is off the weight of their livestock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a uh, production animals like you know cattle and stuff. That's that's a that's a big thing, and mm -hmm. you have to grow a lot of hemp. To help that industry, no hemp everywhere. I, yeah. I, I say everyone, everyone get a shot, but do your homework because man, you can you can make a few wrong decisions. Yeah, and that can be expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Okay, everyone. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. And um, if we don't get another one in before the the holidays next week, well, first of all, for uh, our friends who's Holidays already passed. Happy Hanukkah and Merry Christmas to the ones that the holidays are coming and and um, Happy New Year to everybody. <laughs> yes, thanks, Don. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to spread the word. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, everyone, stay happy, stay healthy. Until next time. Bye. Take care. Seven six five four three two one.